It has been nearly a millennium since the great and vast human empire collapsed, shattered into thousands of disparate factions. So much history had been lost to the eons. Colonies had been abandoned. Many of them either died off or struggled, barely surviving. Some thrived and made their own smaller empires, and some stagnated. To this day, many bold explorers venture into the unknown only to discover old and abandoned outposts of the former empire. Rarely small, isolated human populations are found, like uncontacted tribes living in their own little bubble. Thousands of languages and cultures formed. Many humans don't look alike. Even though the time span in the evolutionary sense is minuscule, the pressure exerted on humans living in less hospitable environments expedited the evolutionary process. In the wake of this chaos, and as our great past faded from memory and from record, a handful of people made it their life goal to hoard as much information about our history, science, and culture as possible. Such was the goal of the young man we see today. A lone wolf who goes through the void, making end meet with small jobs he finds as he ventures throughout the void. His small ship is considered ancient by almost everyone, but the contents within his ship are even more so. Other than digitalized information which is held in the vessel's computers, he has physical copies of books, an object which is considered a relic of an age long past. From many engineering books depicting old machines which are comparatively primitive with the technology offered, turbines and steam engines, internal combustion engines, and old building techniques. Science books which detail theories and equations. Some facts stood the test of time. Some were debunked long ago. History books which detailed the history of the cradle of human civilization, Earth. Now the young man is far, far from Earth. It is questionable if he even saw the planet itself. As a vagabond who visited many worlds in spite his young age, Few decide to take the pilgrimage to the old world. Some people straight up deny that Earth was our birthplace, thinking that mankind had always been in the stars. The man sits at the helm of the small ship he commandeered for so long, red lights blaring as he panics and tries desperately to fix whatever's going on, glancing here and there to the back where the wealth of knowledge stands. He knows that death is highly probable. He is in an unexplored part of the sector. Even if he emits a distress signal, it is highly unlikely it'll reach anyone in time. He is on his own. In his desperation, he runs a scan of the system he is in. And in a stroke of amazing luck, there is a planet which is hospitable for humans nearby. He sets course for the planet, using the little fuel he has left to at least land somewhere. The vessel creaks as the burning orange color of entry envelops the craft as it enters the blue atmosphere of this alien world. The young man fights with the controls as he tries to steer the vessel to land on solid ground. The clouds blocked his view, but he could see hints of ocean below. As he descends below the clouds, he can see land in the distance, a heavily forested area with hills. He pushes the acceleration lever as far as it went to push the ship towards the land. The landing was not gentle. The trees eased the blow and damage that could have been catastrophic. The young man remained conscious throughout the ordeal, only slightly injuring himself during the not-so-graceful landing. When he opened his eyes, he was alive. He stood up from his seat to investigate the damage. He first checked the computers and storage room of the vessel. He saw that the majority of the books and information was intact, a miracle. He put his suit on in case the sensors of the ship had been mistaken, then ventured outside to inspect the exterior damage. He could immediately see that the damage was irreparable. With the tools at his disposal, it would be impossible to repair the ship. Communications were down, and even if they were in function, it is unlikely anyone would pick them up. The forest around him was green and lush. Even from inside his helmet, he could hear the variety of sounds that the wildlife of this planet produced. He was cautious, observing his surroundings that no predator has a jump on him. He is on an undocumented planet, after all. He grabbed a testing kit from his ship to confirm if the atmosphere is breathable. Even though there is thick vegetation, it could all be poisonous for all he knew. As he clicked the small button on the device which tested the air around him, he could hear shuffling from beyond the tree line. His gaze quickly came toward the general direction from where the sounds came from. He inspected that area in detail. He couldn't see anything. 
But as soon as he thought it was just his imagination, the bushes started to move, and from them emerged a large animal. The animal was familiar to the young man. It was a native animal from another faraway planet. It was a horse, and on top of the beast was another being clad in chainmail and an iron helmet. Soon enough the figure was joined by another two beings on horseback. The first being removed its helmet to reveal a face, a human face. Just as the young man wanted to say something, the small device in his hand beeped. Atmospheric scan, complete. Survivability, 100%. The three men on horseback winced at the device's sound. They spoke an unknown language, but the four quickly came to a mutual understanding. We go up beyond the treetops and look into the horizon, the great forest stretching far. In the distance, smoke could be seen, indicating that a settlement was not too far from the crash site. The day turns into night, then into day again, accelerating. The smoke remains stagnant, joined by more lines of smoke every so often. Soon we can see as the trees start to be cut down, houses are erected and roads built. Soon those houses become larger buildings, smokestacks reaching high and spewing black smoke. We see as the forest becomes a town, farmland spanning far and wide. Time slows down and we reach down to the place where the young explorer once crashed. A large building now stands here. The street outside is filled with activity. We see horse-drawn carts and wagons and even a few primitive cars rolling down the street. We enter the building, seeing a spacious interior with hallways in front of us to the left and right. We go forward. We see countless works of art and artifacts dotting the hall. We look to the left and see a thick glass panel. The plaque detailing the object held within is written in a familiar alphabet, the Latin alphabet, but it is in a wholly new language, containing some letters completely foreign to the original script. But the nature of the object is self-evident once we set our eyes on it. A book, old and worn out. Fading letters tell us its name, the Holy Bible. We continue down the hall and see multiple examples of similar glass panels holding ancient artifacts, some of them foreign and some familiar but the hallway has its end. At the end of the hall, we come to a large circular room with a rounded roof, painted in black with small white dots. It has the same look as the clear night sky. In the center of the room is a statue of a man in a spacesuit pointing upwards toward the ceiling. In the center of the ceiling is a map of the continents of the mother planet. North and South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and Antarctica. There is small plaque that has only one sentence written on it in two languages, one in the old tongue called English and one in the native language of this world. You stand on the shoulders of giants. Do not forget them, children of Terra.